All right, welcome back to another great episode of the Money Pillow Podcast. This week, I am really excited to bring you, I guess, our, one of our first real e-commerce experts. I've got Andrew Udarian. Uh, he's 14 years old out of Bozeman, Montana. <laughs> I'm just kidding. If you're listening to this, Andrew's not 14. Uh, anyway, he's out of Bozeman, Montana. <laughs> yeah. Lives in his mom's basement. Uh, anyway, he's out of Bozeman, Montana and has a really cool story. He's got two great websites. Uh, his first one that he started was rightchannelradios.com, CB radio website, and uh, trollingmotors.net is his other website. Uh, these are, I guess he read the four hour work week uh, many years ago, got really inspired. Uh, and I think if I'm not mistaken, within a year, got it to the point that um, it was replacing his regular income or sufficient enough to pay the bills and has since grown tremendously, now doing over a million dollars in revenue annually. Um, has total freedom to do what he wants when he wants. He, uh, in 2011, basically bought a round the world plane ticket and spent seven months hitting up over 20 countries and uh, really just enjoying the good life. And the, the funny thing is I asked him right before we started how his business did during that trip. And he said it actually was the best year, uh, to date at that point. <laughs> First year they topped a million in sales. I think if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So anyway, just has a really great business. Um, I'm really excited to learn a little bit more about the business model and the journey. Uh, and also I should mention too, Andrew has an amazing podcast called e-commerce fuel, uh, that was recently launched getting great reviews and, um, doing really well. So you can find that in the, uh, in iTunes under e-commerce fuel. And it's one word. Uh, when you search for it, or you can go to ecommercefuel.com and there's a link there. So, all right. Is that, was that a fair interview and, or a fair intro? Andrew? Right, yeah, I could, I don't think I could ask for a better one. Thanks so much. Really? All right, cool. I usually suck at doing them. So that's a good, uh, a good thing. Part, that you think it was from, good. Huh? Apart from the part that I'm 14, I was kind of, you know, I am 16. <laughs> <laughs> I hate when they call me 14. No, really? How old are you? Uh, I'm 30. 30. Okay. All right, got to get that out of the way for those that are listening in the car because they might believe that you're actually only 16. So, okay, well, tell me real quick. I mean, you, um, I guess just tell me your story. Where are you at? Not your whole story, but where are you at right now? How are things now? Uh, things things are good right now. Um, you kind of hit on the high points, but I've got a couple of e-commerce businesses that I run, like you said, selling radio equipment at Right Channel and, and Trolley Motors, of course, over at uh, trolleymotors.net. And uh, it's all drop shipped, um, so it means we don't have to stock any inventory. We partner with other wholesale suppliers, and so we can run the business remotely from anywhere because we don't have to deal with you know warehouses and stock and inventory, all that kind of stuff. Wait a minute, how many products do you sell annually, ballpark? Five hundred, two thousand, three thousand. When you mean like different orders, do we have? Yeah, or? yeah, like of just individual items. So like this little widget here, and oh man, um, I I have to think about you know, ten thousand plus maybe. And you don't ever actually touch any of those to the point you have to package them up, ship them, and doing that. Zero. There's, I'd probably say 80% of my catalog I've never laid eyes on. Maybe 90%. Never even seen. 10% never you've seen. seen the physical products, but exactly. But you don't actually ship any of those or doing that. So exactly. That is called drop shipping for anybody who's not familiar with that term. Uh, and what are these just people who have products that they say, okay, basically we'll sell it to you for 50 bucks and ship it and handle all that, and then you put a markup on it sell it, earn the, the difference, and then they handle all the shipping and fulfillment. Exactly. Who, who are they? Is that who you're asking? Like, who no, no, no. My, my, was that kind of the theory and how it works? Oh, yeah. That's a great summary for it. Yeah. That's basically how it works in a nutshell. Okay. And then uh, what about customer support? So if uh, I buy a product and it's shipped out of Iowa, uh, who do I contact? Is it you or do I go back through the shipper? No, that's all us. So, so okay. we'll take care of all the all the marketing, all the front end stuff, the e commerce development, the customer support, customer support, pretty much everything except the you know inventory management fulfillment. Okay, and you don't even have to worry about that because somebody else is doing all that. Exactly. See, I love it. It's a great model, the drop shipping model. Everything is completely hands off. It, it's it's great. There, there's definitely some downsides to it, which we can get into if you want. You know, it's not like this uh, uh, this panacea for e-commerce wealth. That you don't have to worry about anything. Definitely has some downsides, but for getting started uh, and for learning, uh, or if location independence is is really you know something that's really important to you, it's it's a really viable model to to consider. Yeah, no, I love it, and it really kind of plays really well into kind of a money pillow lifestyle where you're not. 
I have a good friend who's got a, a business that they ship a product and the ship, the actual shipping of the product, which is about 10 orders a day, takes several hours a day. And uh, I was talking to him about fulfillment and I can, it can be a real headache and a real pain in the butt. And it was kind of a sticking point on, on some things for him. So uh, you don't even have to think about that. I love it. And uh, real, that's really cool. So, okay. So right channel, tell me your story, I guess, real quick. You are 30. You started right channel radios, what, five years ago? Yeah, I think it was 25. Okay. So five years ago. And what inspired you, I guess, to do that? Where did you get the idea, the concept for it? Were you, were you an over the road trucker using a lot of CB radios? <laughs> I've since cut my, you know, beard down and, uh, uh no, I it was, it wasn't an over, over the road trucker and no disrespect towards over the road truckers at all. It's, uh, that's, that's a, that's you your know, customer base. Yeah. Be it careful. is my customer base. I love them. And, uh, it's a, it's an important job and a lot of hard work involved there. So, sure. um, but, uh, I, I started cause I was actually in finance. I was working in the finance world and, um, we did that for about two and a half years out of school uh, and just, just got burnt out. Um, it was a pretty brutal segment of the, the industry I was in, working a lot of hours, very little flexibility. Were you hammering the phones, cold calling? And- no, it wasn't that so much. It was, it was investment banking, and so it was a lot of just uh, a lot of putting together presentations, pitch books, uh, you know, data analysis, financial models, things like that, and a lot of hours. I, the the, the, the information the work was interesting but the volume of it was what was was tough um, got it were you wearing a suit and tie to work every day for the most part <laughs> it wasn't too bad so this was actually an investment bank in montana which people probably are like what investment <laughs> banks in montana but yes we have them and they're yeah. awesome and uh so it wasn't too bad but it was still you know it was still nice shoes um well i, I thought they were nice everyone else probably thought they were garbage but it was <laughs> you know nice shoes pants uh dress shirt and yeah so it was, you were dressing up um, so you were you were very uh, a skilled ironer. I would oh imagine. my gosh! Yeah. yeah, I would tell you the probably my favorite thing for the first year working for myself was not having to iron anything. I hated <laughs> I ironing with a passion. Oh, because you're always running late. It's like crap. I gotta oh, iron this. I'd, yeah, and I'd always put it off till like eleven thirty at night. The la- I wouldn't I wouldn't be smart. You know, usually I'm pretty efficiency minded, but. Back in those days, I instead of ironing like six shirts at once, I'd wait every night until eleven thirty and iron that one. You know, it's terrible. Yeah, I used to do the same thing. I, I had a job in the banking industry where I was having to wear a shirt and tie every day. And after about three years, I started buying my shirts in threes, and uh, <laughs> I would just always have a set at the dry cleaner ready to pick up so that I didn't have to do it. But oh, the dry cleaners! Yeah, yeah. what a, I every. I was, uh, I was trying to sock away some money so I could quit and start my job. But every like third or fourth week, I'd be like, oh, I'm going to splurge this week and, and go to the dry cleaners. And probably the best money I ever spent in that two and a half years was it's like, like a buck fifty cleaners. a shirt. You know, and then you're like, fuck, I mean, it would take me 20 minutes to iron a shirt because I was I know. I was way too cheap. But looking back, I should have I done it way more. Yeah. It was okay, so, so, <laughs> so you, you had this job. You got burnt out pretty quick after two years. And you're like, well, late one night, you're drinking water and you think, I'm going to start a, a CB channel website or CB radio website. I wish it was, you know, it's so seamless of a transition for the story. And it wasn't, it wasn't I just, okay. no, no, I, I knew that I wanted to do something different. And so, like I said, you know, I was pinching pennies, you know, it dry, you know, doing my own shirts when I hated it more than anything in the world. And, uh, so saved up a bunch enough where I could quit. Uh, and so I just quit cold Turkey and I didn't really know what I was going to do. People would be like, well, you're quitting. What, what, what's your plan? And I was like, you know, I don't know. I just know like, this is not what I want to be doing. You're that crazy guy that everybody is like already predicting your demise. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everyone's just like, you know what, you know, they're like, they're like one third jealous, two third, not jealous. Cause they think you're crazy. And, you yeah. Know, Exactly. Dumb, you know, rough rough yeah. landfall. So I quit. I traveled for you know traveled for uh, about a month, month and a half, and then just started really researching options. And I looked into a bunch of stuff. I looked into like uh, today trading and options trading. Thank goodness I didn't go that route. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I looked into photography at the time. I was really into photography and looked into doing some some something with that. And then the third option was looking into drop shipping uh, and e-commerce and. And where did you get the idea for that? Just out of curiosity, because photography, I get you might have had a passion. Yeah. Day trading, I get you know whatever. But how do you? Where did this come from? You know, I think I'd heard of people doing drop shipping before. I, I for some, in some way, I had picked up on the concept. I'd heard about it. Okay. And I yeah. liked the idea for a lot. Of, you know, really because it was didn't require a lot of capital and and um, a bunch of other benefits. But I just kind of happened to know about it. I think. Sure. Okay. So you got the idea, and then you what? You said okay, well. I'm not thinking of a photographer and 
what was the other one? The um, the day trade. Oh yeah, this is potentially pretty risky. So let me check out. Was it? Let me check out drop strip drop shipping. Yeah, it was, and so spent a month really digging into them, trying them out, uh, uh, and getting a sense for which one of those I thought would be the most viable, and just decided on e-commerce uh, after you know two or three weeks of really digging into stuff. And then I was like, well, hey, I, I got to find a niche. You know, if I'm going to be drop shipping, I've got to find a niche. And for me at the time, it wasn't. I wasn't like, hey, I love photography. I'm only going to sell lenses. Or, right. you know, it, to me, I didn't care as much about what I was selling. To me, I was looking in the rearview mirror and I saw, you know, two and a half years of insane amounts of work, very little personal freedom. And so my number one goal was, hey, I got to, I, I want to get something up that is a viable business. And right. I really am not that concerned with what I'm selling. And so, just did a lot of brainstorming and looking for uh, different niche ideas. Uh, came up with maybe 50 ideas going through, you know, brainstorming anywhere from just thinking of them out of the box to going through wholesaler directories uh, and, and looking through all the categories and writing ideas down. Um, and then I just went through and filtered those based on criteria like, hey, who's, you know, is this a market that uh, is going to be big enough where I actually can make money with it, but it's not so big that like you can go into Walmart and buy everything you need there. The undercut because it's so big, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, looking at competition levels, looking at how sophisticated retailers were, looking at how much value I could add. Um, and so doing a bunch of research and then finally just narrowed it down to an idea, uh, radios, uh, that kind of met a lot of those criteria. And at the time, like... Just curious, though, how did that even become an idea in your brain? I think I think it was going through a supplier directory, going Got through. It. And so just uh, looking through all the different categories. Um, and it just popped out. And I was like, oh, that looks interesting. I'll do a little more research on that later. Put it in the big list and it kind of filtered out at the bottom. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, though. I would think, um, and I'm sure through all your d due diligence, you came to the conclusion that it would be a good good thing to do, and, and I get that, but I would think that um, that industry would be declining. And, it, it, you know, if you look at the trends over time, it is. It is, okay, because I would think yeah, smartphones so. and a lot of other things are getting more efficient, more access, their, their range is better, I would think that would kind of be starting to take the place. Is, is that happening? It is, you know, in terms of smartphones, not so much because CB radios and smartphones are very different in how they're used. Smartphones I use to call you directly to right. communicate with, you know, w w with Sean. Uh, CB radios are more of a, an all a a general tool. area communications. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it. it's, yeah. And so it, it's different markets. And so if you look at it, yeah, it is decreasing. But I don't know. I, I always wonder about those Google Trends things. Because sometimes I'll go into Google Trends and, and you'll look at stuff that it's, you think is going to be pretty consistent, like irons, you know. Um, and you look at irons and it's like it's dropping. I, I don't, I'm not sure if it does. It's just a random example. Right. But you see it declining like by 50% over the last uh, five years. And you're like, what? Are there that many people like you and I who are just, you know, escaping corporate life and not ironing anymore? They're, they're right, dropping right, yeah. No, and and just to, to be clear, are you t you're referring to... Um, what is it called with Google where it shows you trends, Google trends mm -hmm. is, and that's all based on search volume, right? It is. Yeah. Google insights or trends. I think they combine the two. Okay. So the less I get it. So yeah. All right. So, but that would just be my first like reservation with getting into that. So I'm, I'm kind of curious if you saw that or if you just saw that even though it was declining, there was no competition. And so you decided to give it a go or it was, you know, I think I knew that it was gradually declining a little bit. Okay. But I looked at, uh, there's no perfect niche. Sure. And so, you know, it met a lot of criteria. It was declining over time. And so ultimately, you know, if I said, hey, if, if this is what I want to be doing in, in 20 years, probably would not have been the best bet. Um, but I think, you know, radio, CB radios had their heyday back in the 70s and early 80s. And you know, that was, you know, 30 years ago, 35 years Sure. Years ago. And they're still around. They're still being used. And even if it's a slight downtrend, you know, I, I think they'll be around for a while longer. And so, if, to me, the benefits of some of the competitive advantages outweighed the slight you know, downtrend in, in overall Got it. Okay. Volume. All right. Very cool. And I, I know you did your due diligence, it sounds like, to get to that. I just was curious because on the surface, I would think that. Oh, yeah. And maybe no, even five years ago, it probably wasn't as relevant as it would be today. But no, it's, anyway. a, it's a super, I think it's a super, it's a very applicable question. Yeah, it was definitely a red flag. So, um and you yeah, considered that and, and made a, an educated decision on which direction to go based on all the facts you had. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. So you, you decide on that being your niche and you then what? Did you think doing eBay first or Amazon or? No, I, I really wanted to go through and create an online store that create could, a brand uh, and create a store that, yeah. Yeah, and I wasn't so concerned with creating a brand at the time, although I think it's really important, especially today. But I think what, what, steered me away from stuff like eBay was eBay. I always think of people doing eBay and you can definitely make money there, but 
a lot of it, it, it seems like, and maybe I'd be wrong, but in my mind, it was like you have to go and manage a bunch of listings and reset them up and get them to re, uh, you know, reactivate every every you know, now and then. And sure. for me, I like the idea of setting up a store, making it really high quality, and just creating an outlet where customers could self serve because that would be a much more scalable process in terms of uh, in terms of being able to process orders than necessarily something like eBay. Got it. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So what yeah. was the first steps? Uh, how long? I'm just curious. How long after you quit did it take you to decide on CB radios and right channel radios? You know, I quit in November. Traveled for November and December. Half of January, got started with kind of my little, you know, soul searching. What do I want to do with my life? And uh, I think then in decided on CB radios in early February and had the store up and running by early March. So it took about a month. Nice, but that's that's pretty aggressive and pretty good. And what was it? Just you found all the suppliers you needed, started taking product images, placing them on the website, linking them up. Um, I imagine you deal with multiple suppliers or is it just one? I do have a couple different suppliers. And that first month was really just uh, getting a real basic, ugly as sin website right. <laughs> online. Uh, right, you know, getting product descriptions copied over, uh, using a lot of stock photography. And my first website was pretty ghetto, uh, <laughs> and it was just—it it was, it was, it was pretty hideous. And just getting it online um, to be open for business, so I could start interacting with customers. And so it was, you know, two or three weeks of just putting together a website. Sure. Yeah. All right. So you got it up, and what were the first steps? I guess I assume, and I kind of usually joke about this, but I assume you didn't do any business right away. Oh no, no! Like yeah. it, it, most people who have launched a business, you've got all these leading up to launch day. You've got all these like dreams and expectations, and and, uh, and then it, launch day comes and you fling open the doors, and you know it's just like crickets chirping outside, and nobody knows about you. Yeah, <laughs> so, you worked all this, and then there's no reward right away. So, what was it like? That what was that first month like? Uh, the first month, first couple of weeks was a little disheartening. Uh, because it's just, I was running a little bit of traffic uh, with, with AdWords, wasn't getting any sales. Um, oh, you started was, paying for traffic right away? I did, yeah. Maybe yeah. it took a week or two, maybe a week or so. What, um, how long was it until you got your first sale? It took a couple weeks after From launch. somebody other than a friend. Yeah, exactly, yep. yeah. A yeah. couple weeks? A couple weeks, yeah. Okay, so two weeks in, and that come from Google, from paying for the traffic? It did, I believe it came from AdWords, yeah. Okay, and... Um, Okay, so you got your first sale. You remember how much that was for ballpark? Oh yeah, it was like it was to a guy in Washington. I, everyone remembers her first sale. It was good to a guy in Washington. He ordered three. I think he ordered like a cable, uh, an antenna, and uh, a mount. It's like eighty bucks. Yeah, like, and were yeah. you doing jumping jacks and cartwheels when you got it? Oh yeah, I mean, I was downstairs. I remember I was like in St. George, Utah at the time on a weekend trip, and I was, you know, I'd been checking my email like every, you know, ten minutes, and this finally came across, and I was just like, oh yeah. You know, it was just, <laughs> just thrilled, went upstairs and told my, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, uh, about it. And uh, it was great. I mean, it's only 80 bucks. The guy ended up returning it, I think, like I said, you know. Oh, you're kidding. Oh, no. But more importantly, it just, it proved the concept worked, right? Yeah. You know, even if it was 80 bucks and I didn't make that much money off it, it was like, whoa, okay, this guy who's never met me will buy something off my hideous website. This might actually work. I might be able to make a go with this. Yeah, so no, I, I get it. That's amazing. Okay. Yeah. All right, so keep going. So your first sale was two weeks, and then what was the next couple of weeks like in that first month? You know, it, it started picking up right after that, and I'm not quite sure exactly what the – I think it was maybe I got my AdWords dialed in a little bit more. So you were uh, maybe, working on tweaking your AdWords, seeing what was working what wasn't? A little bit, yeah, um, and, and starting to get a little more comfortable with that. But after that, it was probably – uh, sale most days, you know, maybe a couple sales, uh, one to two sales, one to three sales, um, for the first, for the next probably, you know, probably six to eight weeks or so. Wow. Okay. So that's some, that's a major jump from that first two weeks. Yeah. Okay. And I would, I would imagine it probably was from the average just getting them dialed in and getting rid of, uh, ones that weren't working that were eating up a lot of your daily budget, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and just out of curiosity, ballpark, if somebody buys a hundred dollar order from you, because it's drop shipping and you're not you know, one manufacturing and, and making all the profit. What is just typical profit? Is it ten percent, twenty percent, fifty percent? It really depends across the stores. Drop shipping margins are going to range anywhere from ten percent for kind of higher end items, uh, which is kind of on the low end for drop shipping, but ten percent up to you know twenty five, thirty percent on the high end. It's pretty Anything unusual. It's a hundred percent for drop shipping. Yeah. 
if you're doing accessories, so if you're selling smaller items, you can definitely get 100% margin. Sure. Um, but uh, again, those are going to be 100% margin. Let's say you sell a you know a twenty dollar cable. Yes, yeah, yeah, you know, twelve dollar cable you might be able to buy for six bucks. So so yeah. high margin but low profit per order sale. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, I get it. All right. And how much? Just out of curiosity, of your sales now, um, do you have an average number? Do you know the average number? For for margin? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's. Uh, <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> I do. I do know. <laughs> Um, it, it really varies and I don't disclose margins. Got um, it. But, okay. Yeah. Can I will we... say though, it's around, it, it varies between 10, 10% to, to about 25% for my okay. different businesses. Yeah. And then of the ones that are hundred percent markup, what does that look like for the business? Is it 10% of the orders, 20% of the orders? Oh, sure. It, it really depends a lot of times because especially on the radio side, people will buy a radio, which has a lower margin, but then they'll buy a bunch of accessories with it as well. Right. And so, um, I would say... If you looked at a breakdown with accessories, I'd say maybe for you're looking at oh, probably at least seventy five percent of orders have accessories built in, you know, are placed with with accessories, and then maybe. Um, and just with that said, with that yeah. said, are you have you done a lot of testing and a lot of work on um, at the point of purchase, throwing up a bunch of accessories and say, hey, consider this. Others have bought this or things like that. I need to. I have. I've been pretty bad at that in terms of upsells. Uh, I, yeah. I haven't, and I need. That's. It's something I just need to do a better job of. One thing that we have done that is really powerful with accessories. You're talking about accessories and margins and pricing with drop shipping. Pricing is incredibly powerful because you talk about that accessory. Like, you know, um, let's talk about a radio instead because that's a little bit better example. If you're selling a hundred dollar radio, let's say. Um, hundred dollar radio costs you, let's say seventy five. Let's call it eighty bucks. Okay. So your margins a twenty five percent markup on that. Um, if you go in and raise your prices by ten percent on your on your radio, um, you know, customer sees ten percent increase. But the profit you see on the back end as a result of that, uh, you're going from you know twenty dollars in profit to thirty. You're increasing your profit by fifty percent. So you have a huge amount of leverage in terms of the profit you see as you raise your prices. Got um, it. Yeah. And so it's any kind of small margin business, you got to test your prices, even yeah. if, because even if traffic drops, you know, your, tra your traffic can drop by almost by half and you can still be making the same amount of money because your margins have just gone up so much. I mean, the first full-time guy that I hired was largely a result of going in and just spending one day raising my prices on my top 25 items by Oh, I don't know, um, five to fifteen percent, and increase overall profits profits by like thirty to forty percent overnight. You know, wow. It's, and sales it, didn't decline as a result. Well, they they declined a little bit, but the profits overall profits were thirty to forty percent. Way up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, I'm actually looking at this site right now, and um, it's funny. I I have the same issues with my own business. We don't do a good enough job with upselling, autoresponder, follow up. You name it. There's a lot of things, but um, just one little quick thing I just was looking at. The, uh, you may also be interested in the following products. I see down here a lot of accessories. I'm on a radio in, in, in particular. And the uh, two of the five products that are shown look like, um, actually they don't look like accessories, but they just look like things that I might purchase if I was gonna get this. Uh, I, I, I don't know what sign I was on if it was, I bought a car stereo and some speakers recently to replace one that I had in my car. Uh, it was Crutchfield. And they did a, oh, yeah. yeah, they did a great job. I think they put it up right underneath the actual product image and description. And I was like, oh, cool. I'll need that wiring you know, harness. I'll need that mount. I'll need this blah, 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 blah. And I picked them all up just from seeing them right there in front of my face. But if I have to scroll down the page, uh, I may not, uh, I may not see that. So I just... Yeah. Crutchfield is I love Crutchfield. They've got such a, I mean, I, I reference them a lot because it's like you said, they do a great job of upselling on accessories, but they've got such an information rich site. I mean, you can go there and I, I mean, I've got an ebook about picking a niche on the e-commerce fuel blog. And I, I mean, they're like the case study I use. Oh, are they really? How funny? Yeah. yeah. Cause they just do such a good job with information because with drop shipping, you know, the margins are smaller. And so, and there's a lot of competition too. Like we talked about the, the upsides of, of drop shipping, but the downside of drop shipping is because it's so accessible, because you don't have to have a lot of capital or a warehouse, it's, it's easy for just about anyone to do it who's, 
you know, got some time, some motivation, and you know, a couple hundred bucks. And so, a lot more players in the market for for some of those items. And the pricing pressure, the downward pricing pressure, can be enormous because if you don't have any risk for buying that inventory, if there's no cost to you to try to make that sale, any profit is better than no profit. And so people will drive those prices almost down to the bare bone. Got it. Yeah. So they're, they're making like two dollars a a deal. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And so um. So you've got to be able to, to offer something other than a low price. If you try to compete low price with drop shipping, in most cases there are a few exceptions, but in most cases it'll kill you. Um, and so, like for the for the the radio business, having a lot of accessories is a great way to help offset that because the margins are much higher. Because people aren't going to price shop a six dollar or twelve dollar cable as heavily as they're going to price shop a hundred fifty dollar radio. Just kind of human psychology. Yeah. So by keeping those margins really low. Uh, they come to you to buy that, and then you earn a great, great bid on all the accessories they actually probably even need when they buy it. Exactly. That's one aspect. And then also having uh, a niche that lends itself towards a lot of educational content for, for CB radios, for example. Tons of different cables and different types of connections and mounts and antennas and, and what goes with what and what do I need for my vehicle. And there's all this confusion. Sure. Uh, and it's it's hard. Like we, I mean, we spent that first website we put up did a pretty ghetto job of it. We recently relaunched it about a year and a half ago. And we spent, you know, we spent three months straight, myself, some VAs, and a full-time team member in the States here, putting together a new website. Uh, and a huge investment, but it paid off because we really tried to go in and really to help people understand what it was that they needed. And so if you can do that, if you can educate people on what they need and remove that anxiety from buying something that is going to show up and not work, you're going to build a lot of trust. You're also going to be much more likely to have them purchase from you. And if you can get it in a way where all of those, you know, if somebody's got a, a shopping cart full of seven different items, a bunch of accessories, they know works together because your site was fantastic. That's kind of a pain to go price shop over at Amazon or, or somewhere else, even if they can save 10 or 15 bucks because it's all there. It's all ready to go. And, and it's just easy to check out and make that work. Dude, I totally get it. I did that with uh, my car stereo stuff. And I was just like, crap, I don't want to wait for seven different packages to arrive. I'm just going to hit the button and crush it. I might pay a little <laughs> yep. bit more, but I don't care. It's done. You know, so I get it. All right. So just moving along. So that first month, you probably did, I don't know, what, like 50 sales, 40 sales. And like the last couple of weeks were pretty productive. Yeah, maybe. Oh, man, I can't even think. I'd say that first, because it was like March 15th when I got that first sale. So let's say April, probably like 60, 70, 80 sales in April, probably probably 70 around there. Are you there. profitable yet as far as your ad spend versus profits coming in? No, nah, I mean, maybe a little bit. Uh, maybe 500 bucks or something, a little bit of profitability. Um, not so much, though. Fair to say your first month you made around 500 bucks profit. The first full month of business? Yeah, I'd yeah. say that. And what yeah, was that's... that? That revenue's ballpark like five grand in revenues uh man i can't even remember i'd have to go okay. back and look all right yeah. so moving along you're starting to get excited you're getting a little bit of momentum you made enough money for a couple of nice dinners mm -hmm. what um what was the second third month like did you just kind of continue at that pace and went from two to three orders a day to four to five or it started ramping up. It probably stayed, grew consistently. Maybe that second and third month, maybe went up to 90 orders, 110 orders. Um, wow. And okay. was make, making a little bit more money, you know, maybe making up to, you know, $500, $1,000 a month right in there by month three or four. Uh, and But one of the things I was doing is I didn't know anything about SEO or marketing or online business. Yeah. And so I, 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 was out trying to educate myself as much as possible and it, and it ended up coming across this site called uh, this community called Stompernet. Have you ever heard of them? Yeah. Jeremy. Yeah. 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 So uh, run by, I think like Andy Jenkins and, and Brad Fallon at yeah. the time. And yeah. uh, um, anyway, so they had this thing and, and it was $800 a month to be a member, um, which is, you know, uh, it's a good chunk of change for, for that's <laughs> for all your profit. Yeah. Yeah, but I reinvested all that. And so, you know, for signed up for that for, for four or five months, I think I was a member of that and really just just dove in and consumed as much information as I could and, and learned as much as I could about SEO and all that stuff. And so I was reinvesting a lot of the profits of the business back into education for myself. And so even though we were growing, I think, you know, we were probably up at 150, uh, you know, maybe 150 orders uh, uh, right around there, probably by six months. Didn't make a whole lot. I think that first, and I might be jumping ahead here. If I am, feel free to backtrack. But no, I think you're that first, totally good. I think that first year, the net profit for the business was like twelve thousand dollars, <laughs> which still isn't too bad. But let me let me just rewind with the stopper net stuff. That was month three, roughly. Is that what you said? 
Yeah, probably month three. Yeah. And did you get, um, was it pretty much all information or was there software and tools involved or? There was, there might've been some software and tools, okay, but, but, but mainly for you, you ran for the education bit. Yeah. And did you learn some stuff that you started applying? I did. It was yeah. great. I and then you started seeing results. It, and, and most of what I learned was based on organic marketing strategies, how to drive traffic from the search engines. And, and that was what I really started hitting heavily. Uh, for probably, you know, probably the first, once I got in, probably the first, you know, months like three through nine. Right. And just guest posting and reaching out and writing guides and pitching them to, to people and communities. And it, at first, it, you know, it didn't pay off immediately, but over time, you, st- you slowly start seeing the organic traffic come up and up. And by the end of 12 months of really hustling on the, uh, the SEO side, was, was seeing a, a nice chunk of organic traffic. And I think I probably stopped the ad spend at that point. Um, just because I wasn't making a whole lot of money on AdWords. It just was not a very profitable medium for me. Got it. And you were starting to get organic traffic that was converting and, yeah. and working. So like, okay, I'm, I'm breaking even over here. Or I'm losing money or I'm making just a little bit. I could use this money and leverage it for something else. And Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> so first year, kind of a slow ramp up. By the end of the first year, you're at, uh, what, two, 300 sales a month, 400 sales a month? Yeah, I'd say, I think that... Yeah, right around, let's see. Yeah, I think that's probably fair to say, right around there. Okay. And how much are you making after you stopped doing the ad spend on that? Is it just $1,000, $2,000 a month, 3000 yet? No, probably. So at the end of the first year, I was probably making close to... So again, that first year, the profits were 12000 bucks. Okay. Uh, but at a run rate, on a run rate for, um, for right channel radio. So month 13 what the profits were in that month 13 were probably uh, close to, you know, probably around ballpark $4,000 per month that month. So you're not bad. Within a year, <laughs> you've, you've built a decent little income coming in. Yeah. And I had, I had also cut out the stomper net at that point because for five months it was great. After that, I felt like I kind of had got a lot of what I needed. So I didn't have that expense. Uh, and I was applying a lot more of putting a lot more of my knowledge to work as opposed to spending stuff on training and on AdWords, things like that. And so that sure. helps with the margins as well. So just started applying stuff. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then second year, uh, third year, like how was this kind of progression going forward? Did it continue just a slow, slow ramp up? Did you do a big site redesign? Did you stumble upon a gold mine of traffic no, or? No, I wish I could say there was this moment where something happened and like our, there was the moment about pricing. That was a big moment, but I'd say over, over time, it's been pretty gradual. You saw, uh, I think the first year of course is where you're going to see the most growth, uh, you know, really took of course, off. Yeah. Um, but then from, you know, years two, three and four, it was pretty, uh, pretty gradual, just consistent, uh, increase. It stalled a lit, uh, sold a little bit probably in year four. Um, definitely was still the best year that we had, but, uh, the growth slowed down a little bit from a percentage standpoint. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I think in, in year, I guess it was year three, it slowed down a little bit. Year four, the first uh, first part of year four, we relaunched the site. And that had a big impact because we were able to take everything that we'd done, everything we'd learned over the last three years, um, three and a half years, and really incorporate it into a new modern site design that addressed a lot of the problems and questions people had. And so, and uh, I think our conversion went up by like, it was significant. It was 30% between 30 and maybe even, I'm trying to remember. It was a large jump. It was probably between 35 and 50%. Wow. So, which, yeah, is yeah. just, bam, it's, you know, almost, you know, it increases your profits 50%. So Yeah, right? Yeah. Dang, that's impressive. Okay. So you just kind of a slow, steady ramp up. Where are you revenue-wise? I know profit, you said you were around 12 grand first year. What is that equate to in revenue? 100,000, 200,000 roughly, 50,000? Oh, man, it was probably... I uh, feel bad. I'm trying Just to remember, ballpark. Sean. Yeah. 200K roughly, maybe. 200K. And then second year, how did that look? 300? Um, and again, I, I'll, I usually share that revenues for the first one. I don't share past year one revenues for the different breakout of the businesses, Got it. though. Okay. Yeah, right. so. Yeah, no, I get it. I understand. Okay. Um, I didn't know. Just want to make sure. Uh, or if it's significant, I get it. Okay. So when did you, and we, you just mentioned something we haven't really talked about. Uh, since we got in, you don't share the split, kind of how the revenues look between each company. Mm-hmm. So that brings me to, the, I guess, the point where uh, we can talk about trollingmotors.net. Was that um, year two you launched that, year three? That was right after year two, so probably two, a little over two years into the business. 
Okay. So beginning of year three, launched that. Yep. And what, uh, what inspired you to do that? You went bass fishing one day and you thought, man, <laughs> these trolling motors are awesome. <laughs> Super sexy trolling motors. Yeah. Um, no, it, just seriously. They're like in all serious. Yeah, no, it was, um, I had right channel up and running. Yeah. I uh, had brought some people on board to like, you know, a VA to help out with that. And I wanted to diversify, try my hand at another store. Uh, so kind of follow just the same kind of process as I, as I did before to pick a new niche and get something off the ground. I think it was part, part entrepreneurial ADD that we all have. Yeah. Um, that you was part of it. something new to be excited about. Yeah. Also wanting to diversify a little bit in case something went south with my, with my first store. Uh, so I think, you know, and also I had a little more money as well coming in from right channel radios to be able to, uh, to be able to pour back into a business. Yeah. You know, what? I, I, I love the diversity, diversification, uh, thought because that's something we've been I've been implementing into my business just into being in a different areas and uh, I think there's a lot of strength that I mean can you imagine if you weren't selling CB radios to begin with but you're actually selling navigational equipment um, that you know like Garmin and those companies have, I think I've seen like 30 to 40 percent declines year over year oh yeah as iPhone or as cell phones have you know brought mapping to the masses and um, yeah yeah, it, it's but, brutal, you know. And you talk about too, like the, the the downward, slow downward trend for right channel. I mean, I think it's, I think it's still a business, and there'll be enough demand to make it a viable business for. Yeah, know, but there I mean, is actually a trend that's going down, huh? It is, yeah. Yeah, you know. Um, and so I, I, it may not be around in twenty years. I think it'll be around for another five to ten. But I think diversify. Anytime you got all your, uh, you know, you can definitely make arguments on both sides. But personally, I like having at least a couple different income streams in case something goes south. Yeah, no, that's smart. So you decided to do this for those reasons. Uh, you followed the same blueprint. You came to the same conclusion. It's a good market. You build a site. You launch it. Now you have a lot more knowledge going into it. So I imagine this one first year success wise was greater than the other one. Is that right? Oh yeah, I'd love to be able to say that I learned all these great things and took all these lessons and then and perfected it the second time. It was almost completely the opposite. Oh, you're kidding? <laughs> no, I feel like I did it really well the first time with Right Channel. And then I feel like I just botched the second attempt at an e-commerce store. You know, I just totally hashed it. <laughs> wow. And why is that? Like, what? Well, you know, I, I think it was a mindset thing. I think I had something with Right Channel. And so I got a little lackadaisical. I, I wasn't quite as committed. And, and I figured, hey, man, this first business, crap, this took a lot of work to get this off the ground. I don't want to do that again. I'm just going to pay people to do this. I'm going to pay someone to design my site. I'm going to pay someone to do the SEO for me. And so I took a lot of, you know, I took some money I invested. I think it was $5,000 in like a super professional site design right out of the gates uh, before I really knew a whole lot about trolling motors. Um, so you and, hadn't done really any validation? No, uh, I hadn't. Okay. And then I very shortly thereafter invested 10 k uh, which is a lot of money, um, in an SEO contract for six months with a firm. Uh, and so early on, like the results were, probably in terms of revenue and growth, it took off probably a little faster than Right Channel did. Uh, but uh, ultimately really had to kind of, you know, had a couple of days of reckoning with both of those decisions. First one was the site redesign. It was a pretty, a very complex theme. It was built on Magento, which is not an easy to customize card. Oh, I hate uh, Magento. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, you know, I run it now for both my stores, but if I could do it over from scratch, I'd probably pick something else. Uh, and uh, so it worked okay for a while, but after we learned a little bit and wanted to change things up and improve the site, we couldn't do it. You know, I didn't have someone in house as an IT guy because that just was too expensive for how big we were. Uh, I, I'm a little bit technical enough to hash my first site together, but I didn't know how to change this second one because I hadn't done any of it. Yeah. And so we were kind of we were kind of tied, uh, you know, you know, tied up in terms of what we could do. So that was frustrating. And then the other aspect was uh, Penguin, the Google Penguin update rolled around and just annihilated us because this SEO firm had, you know, done a lot of stuff with anchor text, anchor text over optimization. Uh, they'd done some some sketchy linking, uh, some pretty sketchy linking practices. And, and uh, you know, it was my fault. I totally outsourced SEO, which was the core driver for the dropshipping business. Didn't monitor them very well, but bottom line was we lost 80% of our traffic uh, pretty much overnight. So they were gaming the system a little bit. Google made an algorithm change that just made that game the longer one you can play and you got yeah. punished as a result as well, right? Yeah, that's the long and short of it. They just, it was really not diversifying um, the link profile we had. So every time they linked to trollmotors.net, this was at least the biggest thing that hit us. Uh, you know, we'd have pages 
like uh, saltwater trolling motors uh, or something, you know, just for example, if they link to that page from 10 different domains and each one of those links says saltwater trolling motors, it doesn't look natural. Google can spot that and, and they know almost certainly that it's the result of a, uh, you know, a coordinate, coordinated effort to increase your rankings. And so we just got destroyed by that. There was also sketchy stuff they were doing. There was a, uh, an EDU site where there was a blog post for a professor who had like passed away or something. And there were all these blog comments like, we're so sorry. We're sorry for his loss. Oh such my a good God. Man. And they submitted yeah. a comment advertising here. They submitted a comment on there that said like, we're very sorry for your loss. And in the, like the link name, it said by trolling motors at trolling motors. <laughs> like just, Oh, so it wasn't even a software that was doing this. It was somebody manually going in. Yeah, it was manually. So Man, that's ballsy. Online, we just got, we got, we got hashed. But, Did you um, get trashed in your, in your customer support contact us? I can't believe you're, Trying to capitalize on somebody's death, and no, fortunately we went in and and we we removed that. How'd you uh, find it? We did just a backlink analysis because uh, no. we were going through. After we got killed, we went through and we we're trying to clean stuff up, and we and we found it. So, oh my God, do you want to call that company out so no one ever hires them again? <laughs> I, I think I think they're they're under right now, and part of it was you know the the, the guy. I think he was well intentioned. He was doing a lot of the stuff with his own site, uh, and he wasn't malicious, but there was just they were things that I. You know, I should have been more careful in monitoring. Okay. And so did you immediately just get punished with trolling motors and it never really saw much traction early on or? No, it, early on it saw, I mean, probably for a year, close to a year and a half, um, it saw some, some decent traction. Uh, you did? It, okay. it, oh yeah. I mean, we were <laughs> ranking number one, number two in Google for a while on troll for, for trolling motors. Uh, so those, those SEO efforts, even though. You know, they ultimately were <laughs> were a little bit of a ticking time bomb. They they paid off for a while, so I definitely saw some traction there. You did okay. And how were? I mean, what was the first year like for trolling motors? You know, it was, and again, I'm just trying to guessing here, but we were definitely yeah. hundreds of thousands uh, in in revenue. Um, first year, first year, yeah. Dude, that's amazing. Yeah, and, but the <laughs> thing about trolling motors too is you got to think we were selling trolling motors can be pretty spendy. You know, you can it's amazing what people will spend on a trolling motor. It's amazing the technology they have. They've got built-in GPS. Units and trolling motors. You're kidding me. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, wow. I won't, I won't bore you necessarily with all of the details. I could go on for a while, but um, but yeah. So I mean, these are high ticket dollar items. You know, you sell fifty of these trolling motors, you're at a hundred k. Oh, they're two grand a piece. Well, I, that that a little bit of an exaggeration. There are two k. So let's say average trolling motors a thousand bucks. You know, you sell hundred of them and you, and you break six figures in revenue. Wow, wow, yeah. wow. Yeah, I guess they do get pricey. I've seen out here in um, Santa Barbara Zodiacs, which are like those little dinghy boats that go behind sailboats. Yeah. A lot of guys use those to um, go find surf spots. I've seen those for sale with motors, like dialed everything for like a grand. Mm -hmm. So it blows me away. It's that expensive. Okay. So you, so you launched Troy Motors a year in, you've done several hundred thousand dollars. You're pretty excited. And then you get hit by Google. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And where was this last year? No, this would, so yeah, it would have been 2012, so a year and a half ago. year and a half ago, okay. And did you just immediately see, did you get hit on both sites or just trolling and motors? That, that's the funny thing, you know, so the first site, the CB site, um, it was all white hat. I mean, it was all uh, very clean. I did all of the SEO myself, all the outreach, um, and it didn't get touched. I mean, I actually think we maybe saw a little bit of a bump up in, in traffic, not a huge one, maybe 5%, 10%, but uh, it was, no, it didn't affect it negatively. Wow. So you, you, um, that's, that's so funny. You started a second stream of income and probably at that moment you're like, that God, thank God I have two. Cause if they, you know, if, well, if it had just been my only thing. So, so what happened? What was the recovery? Like how long did it take you to recover and get back to levels that you were at prior to the, the slap? Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. So after the slap, you know, you're looking at this and I'm thinking, what do you even do? Do you even, I mean, it's, do you try to restore it? You know, after you wreck your car, you got to make the decision. Do do I, you know, if it's worth seven thousand dollars and there's, you know, five hundred, you know, fifty five hundred dollars in repairs, you got to do. Uh, oh, right, what do you right. do there? You know, and so ultimately decided to do that. And so I think that the Penguin hit, in, which was really the big thing again, April of last year, um, and we we tried doing some site cleanup, some link uh, backlink profile cleanup. Uh, we did some things like, on our homepage, we had a bunch of really kind of kind of fairly spammy footer links. Uh, they just, <laughs> excuse me, link to all of our pages with like super anchor, rich, anchor, uh, text rich keywords. And, uh, so, so we were doing 
a little bit of de-optimization on page. We were trying to go back to some of those sketchy links and get them cleaned up, like the, uh, uh, you know, the one that was commented on that uh, that obituary page for for someone <laughs> oh in Memorial. God. Got yeah. that removed, you know, uh, and that took us. You know, we probably did that for about six months, but we really didn't in enforce turnaround and start redesigning the website until probably about six months later. Uh, so probably that fall, spent two or three months really just doing a, a full on full court press redesign of the website from scratch. Launched that in February, uh, and that helped a lot. Uh, so you know, after that launch, so this is a little under a year later, probably ten months later, maybe nine or ten months later, relaunched the site and. <sighs> It was actually a fairly large success. I mean, I think the conversion rate, I wrote a post about it over e-commerce fuel that really goes through the before and after. Uh, and I think on a conversion basis, our conversions were up just shy of 50%. Uh, but also our average order value was up, I think, by almost uh, more than a third or close to a third. And so between wow. those two metrics, uh, we almost doubled our revenue. And so we're sitting there. Is that at that point, are you back to where you were prior to being slapped or ahead of just yeah, just about. We're right about at that level. And so on one hand, it's really nice because you're like, this is awesome. We restored the company. We're kind of back where we were. On the other hand, I'm thinking, oh, man, where would we be if we had this great new site and we'd done some legit SEO and hadn't totally you know, bombed out our SEO profile? So that was a little – so it was kind of a double-edged sword. Um, but uh, so it took about – Took about nine months with probably from, from SEO Google slap to when we relaunched. Uh, took about a nine month period where we worked probably pretty focused on that for oh maybe two or three months. Got it. Okay. And at this point, so we're at year kind of in the beginning of year four. Is um, CV site is that growing still slowly or is it kind of plateaued or? It is. I think every, we've we've grown every year on the CV site. Wow. Uh, yeah, and same with the trolling motor site. I. I yeah, even with that slap, uh, I think we've grown every year with with the uh, with the trolling motor side as well. And so, uh, I definitely, I mean, it's the growth has tapered off. I mean, you're gonna have you're gonna see the the fastest, most rapid growth, of course, early on. But uh, we have grown every year, and and especially this year, what's helped has has been some of our email marketing. You know, we've really that's what I was gonna ask. Yeah, yeah, you know, because we've got we've got SEO going on, uh, and we've got over the past you know four and a half years, we've built up a, a fairly large customer base, and had been pretty terrible about remarketing to those existing customers and so this year started making email marketing more of a priority and you know I, uh, I have the same problem in my business I don't do any I'm so stupid I mean you just get lazy because you're doing well or I do anyway and I go off and enjoy life and instead of just buckling down for a couple of days and writing a bunch of email copy um, I just lose so much opportunity can you inspire me and just tell me, since, <laughs> so do you have autoresponder campaigns with your current customers or is it more just promoting more to those customers? It's more we're working on getting some, some autoresponder campaigns set up. Uh, what we're doing now, <laughs> excuse me, I apologize for keep coughing. What we found is we use a piece of software called Clavio. Uh, and for e-commerce entrepreneurs that, that have a substantial list, it's, 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 it's going to be well worth the investment because it's really what's, powerful. What's the software called? It's called Clavio. Clavio? Yeah, K-L-A-V as in Victor, I-Y-O. Okay, and just so anybody knows that's listening, I'll link this up over at themoneypillow.com. Uh, I'll link up Clavio and I'll link up the blog post you mentioned a minute ago, which I'm interested to see how the conversions where you said it was really detailed. So what exactly does Clavio do? So, so uh, Clavio or Clavio, I, I always mispronounce it, but it's just, think of it as Aweber on crack for e-commerce. Uh, and so you can I'm go in there. I'm kind of scared of that thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good thing. Okay. okay. So oh, like the good, kind of <laughs> yeah, good kind of crack. Yeah, the good kind of crack. Yeah, I probably should maybe be careful with my drug <laughs> references teasing, a man. little bit more. Um, but it just allows you to do a lot of behavioral segmenting for e-commerce. So Aweber, uh, you can't really segment, but with Clavio, you can say, okay, we want to send, uh, we want to have an autoresponder series that goes out to customers who purchased this product with this product. Uh, and so you can set that up. You can say, I want to send out this autoresponder series to people who have purchased four times in the last 30 days with this. And so you can get very, you can build out very customized automated campaigns for your customers. Uh, and so it's powerful. And so we've been using that. But what we found even more is that just, just blasting your customers, and blasting is probably not a very good term, just sending targeted. Just abusing your customers. Just, That's better. Just spamming the heck out of your customers. <laughs> no, I get um, it. But uh, behaving like a, a real company and marketing to your existing customers. Even just just 
just showing up, having you know a, a one one email on a weekly basis, a biweekly basis, a monthly basis, sending it out to your entire customer base without necessarily really segmenting. That's where we've we've driven probably eighty plus percent of our revenues from our e-commerce marketing. And so it's just showing up, just getting some offers out there, even if they're not perfect or even if they're not targeted for every single customer. And we've seen in the first, I think the first three months we did this, by month three, we were driving 10% plus of our revenues from email marketing alone. Wow. Uh, so, you know, it's, wow. it definitely, I mean, it's just something where it's, it was a no brainer and I don't know, it's, it's like you, you know, there's all this stuff and that's one of the, I'm kind of, I'm kind of going off on a rabbit trail here. So feel free to rein me back in, but it's hard as, when you're when you're doing doing stuff, and especially if you've got a couple different businesses or a bunch of different uh, kind of arms to to one business, there's so many things you should be doing. Like I have a list that's like you know 50 thing 50 items long, oh all the things I should it. be doing for my business, uh, and it's tough because because you gotta you've got to be able to prioritize those. And uh, I think you know, email marketing is an easy win. There's a lot of A/B testing and price testing like for this for the radio site that I've neglected. Uh, yeah. because things have been going well. And then also because I've been focused on like e-commerce fuel and these other things that I've got slated for, for this fall, but it's, it's hard. I think, I think we could all be better at doing that. But I think the key in that is really looking at for where are those huge big wins, uh, that are going to give you the most bang for the buck that you can implement. Cause you can't do everything. It's impossible. Yeah. You know what? That's what I did. I, I identified two things. One is, is paid traffic strategies, uh, that we're currently not doing cause we get just a bunch of referral traffic, SEO and organic. And uh, the other is autoresponders for the buyer. We I have forty to fifty buyers a day, wow. and I have zero follow up. So just last week, I just called a great copywriter I know, and said, "Hey, write a series for this particular product." And uh, we discussed it for ten minutes. And I know he writes a little more salesy, a little more spammy than I like, but I know he'll give me back fifteen emails that'll go out over a month, and I can look at those and in an hour to two edit them and get them the way I want in my kind of wording and my verbiage and it'll be done. And I'm sure that particular product gets 10 sales a day. So that's 300 customers a month. that will go into a funnel. My guess is that will generate another hundred to, well, I don't even know what to expect, but I'm guessing around a hundred additional sales a month, which equates to about 10 grand in additional revenue just from nowhere. Yeah. And then if I, if that goes well, well as soon as I get the copy and it looks good, then I'm going to have him implement it for all the other products. Where are you finding good copywriters? Is that tough? Um, you know what? I usually just get referrals from friends. And this particular person is somebody I've worked with for a long time. So they can do a little bit of everything. And uh, But if you need a copywriter referral, I've got a, a great one. But the problem that I have personally with 99% of the copywriters is they write in a way that for me is just a way that I wouldn't want somebody to send me an email. You know, it's just too spammy, too salesy. So what I do is I generally hire copywriters, go through the whole thing, have them explain the psychology behind the wording that they've done. And then at that point, after I'm done, I just say, okay, thanks. And then I take the copy and just tweak it. And, um, and then I'll run an A-B test against their copy versus mine. And as long as we're close, even from just a hair underneath theirs from a conversion standpoint, a revenue standpoint, uh, at least I know that the messaging is the way I want it. And I'll take that. But I've had situations where they're twice as good as mine. I'm like, well, all right, screw it. I guess I just have to roll with this because <laughs> I'm doing this to make money and not, not to not irritate people. And yeah, uh, it's cool to hear you say you go through that thought process though, because I've uh, that, that's one thing that I struggle with too. Is is even if something, uh, I'd rather make a, a few less dollars than come across as you know car salesman, say really low. Uh, well, yeah, I, I completely agree. And you have to think like we, a lot of our stuff, um, we take a little bit of a hit from a branding perspective. So we'll change the branding. So it looks really professional. And then we've got this other ugly page that seems to work better, but mm -hmm. I'm totally okay. If it's 10% less, I think the value of the branding is way more valuable long-term than trying to make that extra 10% upfront. Well, the other thing too, is you it's easy to see the increase you get from from those sales, right? The type of people that are going to respond to that type of copy, it's it's tangible. You can see your analytics and your increased dollars spent. What you don't see necessarily is the people who go through your autoresponder and they say, whoa, I thought this guy was legit. This is really scammy sounding. I'm not going to invite him on this interview. I'm not going to invite him to this community. I'm not going to reach out to I'm not going to refer my friends to, to the product. Yeah. 
yeah, exactly. you don't necessarily see that. And so that stuff, if you're trying to build, if you're going straight for direct marketing sales on a product by product basis, you know, that might be an approach you can, you know, maybe is more viable. But if you're trying to build up a brand, it's, I think, I think it's really wise to kind of do what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, I, that's always kind of been our approach. We take the, the lower road in order so the long term looks better and it's, it's worked so far. But, you know, I may just get to the point where I'm like, screw it. I'm just going to go with what works. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. You know, all the guys that I know that have been doing this for a long time uh, have gone that route. But I just don't think, for me personally, it's something I want to do. And I don't know. We'll see. So anyway, so, yeah, it's interesting to hear, though, you say you kind of have the same, a lot of the same issues and challenges. I mean, every time I go to conferences, people say, you know, I always see it at the networking stuff, but I never see it at the event. And I just say, yeah, I don't need another shiny object. I already know what I need to do to double and triple my business. It's just a matter of. I guess getting off my ass and implementing it and not getting <laughs> caught up in all the day-to-day stuff. So, but yeah, so I've gotten good at that lately and it just, um, it's taken a while for me to kind of wrap my head around. I mean, I'm so stupid. This is what I do, but just letting go and saying, okay, cool. Here's a thousand bucks. Give me 20 emails, 15, 20 emails. And then I can then sit down and go read it word for word and just change what I like. And, and it's done. And then all of a sudden, you know, boom, we did that with some upsells earlier. I didn't have upsells on our products. And it, it meant a 30% bump uh, immediately, which was awesome, except the front end sales took a hit, you know, a 10 to 15% hit up front, and it almost kind of equaled out. Uh, but I, usually summers are slower for us, for our, our industry. And I just was like, oh, that sucks. But then I'm like, well, I'm grateful I did that, or I'd be down here, you know, without that. And then now falls kind of hit, and our sales are going back up again. I don't know why. We seem to be somewhat cyclical with the seasons, but. Um, but now it's really starting to pay off and I'm just, now I'm looking at those and like, okay, I probably should work on those, get those more, more, more refined. And anyway, it, uh, it's always a challenge, man. But the good news is, you know, things are starting to happen and, and get it done. And hopefully within a couple months I can sit back and just go, wow, this is all, you know, that was really worth putting all that time and energy for it. Yeah, no, I hear you. It's, uh, it's amazing too how much if you, if you can hustle for a short period of time, if you can, that's one of the things I, I think I, with my businesses is you can never have, you're never gonna have an automated business. I mean, I know, you know, the money pillow is all about building, you know, having yeah, automated but income. fully automated where you're not doing anything. Yeah. Fully automated. And the two things I've found is one year, I mean, you've got to either go out and invest a bunch of money for it or you've got to, to, to bootstrap it or, or build it yourself. And you can get those automated businesses, I think for a long period of time, but it requires, you know, two things it requires really hustling at the beginning like with my with my CB business, I'd say eighty percent of the marketing that I put in because it's mostly driven by you know uh, kind of old school uh, marketing referral guest posting SEO. Uh, there's some other things we do, but that's the lion's share of, of how I built that that business. Right. And probably eighty percent of the work I did for that was in the first you know uh, probably the first twelve to eighteen months. And after that, I mean, I've done some, but really really took my foot easy, off the easy, gas yeah. pedal and, and and but it was it was busting it for for you know 12 to 18 months after that though that's powered the business for five plus years we're coming up on six years you know yeah. and uh Do you so ever stop and wonder what if i spent another month hustling really hard what that might impact might be don't, oh don't say that don't say yeah, that just, i know right <laughs> Well, no, as long no, as things are good, true. you know, that's the it's only true. thing there's, and it's funny though, just a couple things, uh, Mike Hansen and Mike Teku, I don't know if you know them from the brotherhood. Um, but I interviewed them and they literally seem to have built their, uh, I don't know what they, I guess their business, I was gonna say product, but their business from the beginning to be hands off. Um, and so there was kind of a, a break in that theory, so, but you're right. 99% require a ton of hustle. I mean, those guys got so lucky within a few months, they took a three month road trip and made money the whole way. And, uh, but, but they do work hard now and they came back and like, all right, well, this is good. We're doing this now. We can just do this, this and this, but anyway, completely agree. So let's just kind of move back, um, get a little off track here, but you've got, so you've got this year, let's just go to, I guess, the beginning of this year at this point, both sites are up, both sites are cranking, doing really well. Is are things growing this year? They will. I think we'll do. I think yeah. This will be unless something something crazy happens this year. 2013 will be better than 2012. And are you, you're over seven figures between the two, site, two sites and, and we revenue. are. Yeah, we'll probably do close to a million and a half this year. That's amazing. That's amazing. What um, what's next for you? Just continue keeping on, keeping on, or 
It's, it's a good question. You kind of ask it at an interesting time too. I mean, obviously the e-commerce fuel brand, which is uh, something I've been working on a lot uh, over the last year and a half, that's been really, uh, really rewarding and fun to put together. I get to connect with a ton of great e-commerce entrepreneurs, uh, and so I've got a, a, a form, a private community over there for for people who are really in the game, people who have you know stores that are up and running and generating revenue and uh, e-commerce professionals. And so I've been nurturing that over the last three to four months. Uh, I'm excited to see how that grows in the future. Um, you know, been doing some e-commerce training over e-commerce fuel, kind of like some premium training that does uh, really uses my stores as case studies on how to build up businesses. So I've been working on that. Uh, yeah, dude, I checked out that site and you just get a ton of traction. Really, the articles were all great. Well, again, we'll link this up as well. So definitely go check that out. It, um, you have a podcast for that. So the podcast and the site are both, I haven't listened to any of the episodes yet. Um, I probably should. I'm doing a little bit of e-commerce stuff, but, um, anyway, I'll link those up over at the Great. Thank so, you. Yeah. Um, and, and like, you know, the podcast podcast is just a great excuse to get really fun, awesome people on, on, you know, on the phone and be Ditto. able to, to talk. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, I mean, this morning I talked with a guy out of New York who who built up a you know a multi million dollar drop shipping business and sold it to a private equity group, uh, and uh, you know last week talked with uh, you know Dollar Shave Club Michael yeah. Dubin from you know talked with him about he how he built up his business and it's just it's just such a cool way to not only build your own brand and your own uh, and be able to help people but but to connect with awesome people so I've been is, doing that is the Dollar Shave Club interview live yet. It is. It went live today, actually. It did. Okay, I've got somebody who just started one of those and sold out their first day, like an hour into their first day. They had a cap of two hundred of a recurring product like that. And um, oh, really? Yeah, not shaving. It was a mommy package for kids and moms. And but yeah, so I'm just, I'm, I'll share that with her. She'll be stoked to hear that. I'm oh, sure. oh, cool. Yeah, it's uh, he's got some interesting things on, on recurring revenue and you know subscription model. So, um, but yeah, in terms of I'm kind of kind of dancing around the question, but in terms of what next, I'm not I'm not sure. Um, you know, I'd like to eventually uh, start up another e-commerce business, probably something that's a little more inventory based versus drop shipping, uh, kind of given some of the things we talked about. I'd like to build a brand around a product. Um, but at the same time, I'd like to keep e-commerce fuel going, going as well. And I've got a lot of ambition for that. Uh, just to are you, to are the, you monetizing that yet? I am. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, how's that going? Course, uh, good, good. It's going well. Um, I'd say, you know, the first year made almost nothing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, just because my priority was not to was not to monetize the first year. My priority was to build an audience, to give a lot of value, and to to build trust and authority. Right. Uh, and so the second year, it's been going well. The course sales are good. The form doesn't make nearly as much, but it's it's. I think it has more long term potential, and it's something that just takes longer. Oh, to you grow. have courses. I didn't even know that. Yeah, so the, uh, the it's called the Insider's Guide, and that's kind of the. I've got a free ebook for a fifty you know, five page ebook that really walks through. You know, picking a niche, uh, but then if you really want to get a little more serious, and and uh, it's a it's pretty intense. It took me like three months straight to put this course together. But wow, <laughs> uh, I have that for sale. And then there's a the form membership is you know it's 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 like twenty five dollars a month. It's not I don't know. There's these forms that cost like hundred you know thousands of dollars sure. a month, and that's you know <laughs> that's not what, not what I'm selling. So, uh, but it does have some really good quality people. So definitely monetizing it like a couple ways that way, and it's it's been going well. I mean not. Not making as much as the e-commerce businesses, but it's it's been a good year for the blog and the community. Are you getting uh, any sponsorships for the actual blog content? You know, I've had offers to do that from multiple places, and I haven't taken those up yet. I think, you know, anytime you think about sponsoring something like the blog or the podcast, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the copywriting, right? You know, if you land on a page, you read a lot of really good, high-quality content. You may not click on that affiliate link. You may not, you know, see that banner ad immediately, and it's not something you can monetize. But you're building a lot, much more, I think, confidence in the long term and and uh, belief and support in that brand. Uh, I think anytime you bring advertising into something or a sponsor, it either dilutes the message a little bit or it gives you a conflict of interest. Because if I've got sponsors on the podcast, for example, uh, and then not to say I won't do this in the future, but it's something I definitely think about especially e-commerce, right? Because the people that really want to sponsor my podcast are people who are going to be targeting those customers. Right. All of a sudden, I get a sponsor on the podcast. I can't talk completely objectively about that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I hear you. I, I mean, these people who say that... You've you got an interesting conflict that I don't have, really. I mean, if Audible or Clarity or any of the guys that I've had that I've worked with already, like that really doesn't conflict with anything I talk about. you know? Right. And a lot of, there's a lot of great services out there that I might, might recommend. Um through a paid sponsorship that I believe in that really don't 
Yeah, I get it. But you, since you actually sell products, if you take one of your advertisers, then I'll say, yeah. Can you hear yeah. that? Uh, a little bit, but it's not too bad. Okay. All right. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't even thought about that, but yeah, I can see how that could be a predicament. Uh, but you do have plans to kind of further monetize it and keep growing it. Uh, the e-commerce field, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. So yeah. it's it's um, you know something that I want to do. And I are there experts it. in that space that have giant email lists and big products? And say that again. What are there the experts thing? in the e-commerce space that have giant email lists and a lot of products? And you know, it's funny. That's one of the reasons I got into the the. the and to blog about e-commerce because you look, there's tons of guys writing about blogging. There's tons of guys talking about social media, uh, affiliate marketing. There's very few people, you know, I can name on one hand, the number of people who are writing stores or writing content and trying to build an authority site uh, about niche e-commerce. Right, uh, right. You know, there's a handful of people that if you're a Fortune 500 or a Fortune, one, not a Fortune 1000, but uh, if you're a fairly large company, tons of corporate uh you know, uh, stuff for e-commerce, but not as much individual. Right. Interesting. All right. So, well, very cool, man. It's, I'm just thinking about your journey and the whole thing. And it's, <laughs> it's really a pretty awesome one. It, you know, you had no interest prior to starting this and CB radios and all that. And, and through the process, probably whatever process you went through, um, or whatever advice or training you had, you determined that that was going to be a good niche. Then you built something, you've got uh, a second site now that they're both seem to be doing pretty well. I mean, you're over seven figures in, in revenue or one and a half million. I think you said roughly this year, dude, that's, that's phenomenal. And then you've also got this amazing brand in the, um, e- was e-commerce fuel. Is that right? An e-commerce fuel. It seems like it's, it's a platform that's ready to, to kind of take off. So very cool. Very good stuff. Andrew, man, I'm, uh, it's just, it's been cool to hear your story and I'm, I mean, it'd be interesting to follow you over the next year to t- year to two or three and kind of see what, what becomes of, of the sites you've got and then what other, other things you get into and, and build up. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. It's been fun coming and talking on and appreciate the opportunity to, uh, you know, bat some ideas around and, and yeah. tell, tell my story. It's, uh, it's been great. It's good connecting with you personally as well. So. For sure. And I always do, and I forgot to do this, but I always do this cause I do this selfishly and I think people get a lot of value out of this. Any good books or book or books you've read recently that you might recommend from a business or motivation or inspirational? Yeah, simple? absolutely. Yeah. Excuse me. I, there's two that have stuck out to me. Uh, I read about a book, Entree Leadership by Dave Ramsey. I'm a big Dave Ramsey guy, a big personal finance guy. Um, and so that was a, an outstanding book. It was. What was it? Entree? Uh, Entree Leadership. E N T R E. Okay. Entree Leadership. Uh, and uh, it, just a great, solid book about about building company. Not, and it's it's more on the management side. It, it's on dealing with people. Uh, how Dude, do you I build up a company? So I'm the worst. Oh yeah, I, I hear you. And so it's uh, a great book on leadership and, and, and management. Um, so that was that's one I would recommend. Another book I'm reading right now that I wouldn't necessarily uh, I don't know if it's a business book, but uh, Kitchen Confidential by Anthony Bourdain. Reading that right now, and uh, I think one thing that's I tend to read a lot of business books. Yeah. And I think I don't know. Some people will probably take issue with this, but man, after I read like four or five business books, if I dive into another one. I feel like you get some some diminishing returns. And no, I get it, dude. I get it. I, yeah, about every four or five books, I switch it up and read just some random book. Yeah. What's, oh yeah. What's a good random I, book you've read recently to kind of take you out of the business mindset and just oh, relax? That, well, that's when I, I, I was mentioning that. Uh, ki- uh, oh, the kitchen, kitchen confidential. Kitchen confidential, and it's just good because it. I don't know for me being able to read and, and get outside, you know, take a break from business, give it just a little bit of my head, a little bit of room. I get really creative when I, when I read, when I go into other people's worlds like that, that are a little non-business related. Uh, and he actually, there's some actually some pretty interesting business insights you can take from that book as well. But, uh, uh, you know, he's got one section in there I absolutely love where he just is like, I don't know why anyone starts restaurants. It's like the worst business model in the world. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's what the book's all about. You know, yeah. Have you read it? No, but I, I know what he does. And yeah, that's funny. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know about you, but, uh, man, when I walk down like main street, like in, you know, in our downtown main street, I'll walk down and down the street and look at shops and I'll be like in my head, I'll be doing like calculations. Like, okay, your monthly overhead's this, you're selling this. I'm guessing this many people come through. How in the world do you stay in stay business? Open. I don't understand it. I, I feel the same way, man. And then every guy that I know that runs a restaurant runs a restaurant, the majority of them are there 80 hours a week. And I'm just <sighs> like, dude, I think I'd rather work at the post office. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> and make it's, it's, any wage than do that. But anyway, and that's no knock on working at the post office, but you know what I mean? Yeah, Dude, I, a, 
I got a good book for you. Uh, if yeah. you like to deviate, it's um, the boy who harnessed the wind. Oh, okay. And just, I mean, completely uh, non-business, but this amazing story about this kid who grew up in Africa, who at the age of nine built a windmill and he learned through reading books and all of this stuff how to build a windmill and generate energy uh, to literally like have his family had no electricity prior to that. 99% of the people in his 500 uh, village town had no energy. Actually, I think a hundred percent of them, just the town center had it. And um, anyway, fascinating book, super inspirational and kind of eye opening uh, as to you know how Africa can be for a lot of people, a lot of the sad parts, happy parts. Uh, a lot of defeats, a lot of big wins, you know, so anyway. Very cool. I'll have to yeah. check that out. Thanks. Yeah. There's a little bit, there's like three or four pages where, you know, they believe in some kind of old school stuff with witchcraft and whatever. And he, I think he still to this day genuinely believes it because there was three to four pages uh, of just wacky writing about, uh, which, you know, demons and witches and this and that. I was like, okay, just kind of flipped a couple pages. But, uh, other than that, the whole book was, was awesome. Nice. So, all right, man, are you, are you on social at all? Do you do Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn? I uh, do. Yeah. You can uh, probably, you know, you can go over to, uh, I think it's uh, Facebook, you know, dot com forward slash Andrew dot Udarian. Um, and then on Twitter at Udarian, you spell that Y O U D as in dog E R I A N as in Nancy. So, but you can get, you can find me on all those places over at ecommercefuel.com. That's with a funky last name like mine. That's probably the easiest way to get me. Oh, you're lucky. You don't have to deal with much as people competing for your, yeah, for your name. Can you imagine having a name like Mike Hill or, you know, I know some people that are pretty big experts and they share names with other, you know, one guy is, is a, shares a name with a, a famous male ice skater. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, all right, dude, well, I'll link up that stuff and uh, maybe just shoot you if, if you've enjoyed Andrew and his podcast, shoot him a message on Twitter or definitely go over to his site and leave him some comments. Really appreciate having you on, brother. It'll be interesting to follow uh, your journey. I can't wait to kind of see where you go uh, from here. And, and between you and me, let's you and me stay in touch. I'd love to uh, kind of hear how some of the things, if we're both implementing autoresponder stuff for ours, see how it pans out for the two of us, see if there's something we can learn from each other. And... Yeah, I would love to, man. I appreciate the opportunity to come on, and uh, thanks a lot for having me.